From reviews to rankings, the big picture is all things movies. From in-depth analysis of the latest flick to sit-down interviews with some of the biggest movie stars and filmmakers on the planet, Sean Fennessy and Amanda Dobbins have got you covered. Check out The Big Picture on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Anytime Fitness. We may talk a whole lot about sports, but when it comes to keeping fit ourselves, there's definitely room for improvement. I hit this point early July. I was just like, I am not in good enough shape. I started trying to walk at least 15,000 steps a day or hiking or just anything to keep my legs moving. Now it's the end of 2023. I feel great. I had a physical uh, three weeks ago and the guy was like, you're doing great. You're doing better than you were three years ago. I felt great. Whatever your goals are, progress is possible. Thanks to Anytime Fitness. Get a personalized plan and support from an expert coach anytime, anywhere. Visit anytimefitness.com to try Anytime Fitness for free. Start to train for your life. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. See website for details. This episode is brought to you by State Farm. From your morning podcast to your afternoon playlist, State Farm knows you personalize your entire day. And that's why State Farm helps you personalize your insurance with the State Farm Personal Price Plan. It offers coverage options that help protect what you care about most at an affordable price just for you. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Prices vary by state. Options selected by customer. Availability and eligibility may vary. I need sports to have to clear the room. Stand up and walk. Now. Hello and welcome to The Watch. My name is Chris Ryan. I am an editor at TheRinger.com and joining me for the 591st time, it's Andy Greenwood! On The Watch, because there's a bunch before that too, right? Yeah, yeah. Then we had all the Hollywood Perspectives pods. We, did, we just blew past 500. Can you believe that? No, but I'm glad you brought that up. You used that number because we were just trying to figure out what it was. Because I we just were could not think of a, a recall election or a high holidays <laughs> joke. So I just, I guess I was looking for it. Well, that's because then you were also like, maybe I don't need to introduce you. Maybe you should introduce me. And I'm just like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like for a podcast that has three guardrails, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like we should hold on to them. I don't think you've ever introduced me. Um, I did, well, let's see. I, there was a, one bit I used to do, people loved it. I, I, I just, I just know that was when you were away, which almost never happens. But oh, the that's few right. Times you always have away, like a semi-famous or very famous person on and they would pretend like I was, I did a bad job, right? Like I would introduce Jake Johnson as you yeah, or something. Yeah. yeah. Um, that was always my, that was always my little bit. That was fun. But all of this is to say, A, I don't think we should change it. Thank you for your service to me. Yeah. We've done a lot of podcasts. We're not stopping. But it does put on the radar. You know, we don't need to answer this now live on mic, but I believe January is our 10-year anniversary. Oh, my God. Is that right? Yeah. You and I are so, going through it, man. 25 years of friendship, nearly 10 years of podcasting. Mm-hmm. What was what was our friendship before the podcast, you know? Tenuous at best. <laughs> I, I, I mean, it's, I, we, we should probably admit it. It, was, it's it was so nakedly a business, a business relationship, you know, which is fantastic. Trading. Yeah, which is why you won't do the intro. It's, it's great because yeah. we go out for drinks on occasion, and I'm like, I'll get this round, and you're like, oh, my friend, that's so nice, and I'm like, I can write it off. <laughs> this, is, this is a business meeting. It's good stuff, but let's put that on the radar. I know people in the Facebook group um, when they're done fighting about what we meant to say about why the last man could probably jump in and make some suggestions. Like, how should we mark this occasion? Sure. I, Merch? I mean, we could, yeah, we can anniversary have, show. If anybody from the dark web wants to dig up the Hollywood prospectus podcast, maybe we can make greatest hits of, of, of our time together. Hey, Andy. So today on the watch podcast, which is it's on a Thursday, we can talk a little bit about the shakeup over at Paramount. That's been in the news. Just looking at the trades. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of seismic activity. We had this Paramount shakeup. I think we mentioned Jim Giannopoulos leaving as the head of Paramount. And now Brian Robbins is coming in. He was the president of Nickelodeon. He was also... I'm trying to wrap my head around this. Yeah. He Do was it. the star of Head of the Class. Whoa, well, whoa, whoa, Howard Hessman whoa. was the star. Whoa. <laughs> Howard Hessman, and then Billy Connolly. And Robin and then, Givens, yeah. Robin yeah. Givens, and then arguably the guy who played Arvid. And then... 
And then Brian Robbins. Brian Robbins, right. Uh, who has gone on to have a career as a director and a producer and was running Nickelodeon is now running Paramount. We can talk about what that means for Paramount, but what it kind of more means for the streaming services. I don't know if you wanted to give any any sort of last minute Emmy predictions. I'm going to go in Green Room on Sunday and, and do my CR's Stone Cold Locks of the Century uh, for, thought, for the I Emmys. Yours, I, I, my, I heard you and I know what Green Room is, but part of my brain was like, Chris thinks Green Book is going to win the Emmys too. <laughs> that is a take. Um, and That's then cool. you and I wanted to talk, spend most of this show, I think, talking about uh, the TV show that we think is one of the best shows of the year and is certainly the best thing that's on TV right now, I think, which is Reservation Dogs. And I also want to give a overdue shout out to a Netflix show called Feel Good. That's right. Um, which, by the way, I think there's some interesting segues to talk about with Reservation Dogs and why those two shows, both of which are at least upon, you know, on first glance, relatively unassuming half-hour comedies are so much more and have done more emotional and dramatic work than, you know, the purported big guns from sure. the past year. But you want to start with Trade Talk? Let's I wish talk we, about, we should get a theme song. For let's trade move talk. the mountain, man. Let's move Paramount closer to us. So I think that it's funny because you said that we, we, we did touch on Jim Giannopoulos. And by the way, you and I, big fans of Big Jim G., yeah, I mean, he's years. not a he's not quite Bob level. No, he's not, he's not he's a Bob. Not, no, I mean, that's it. And but that's his cross to bear. You know what I mean? He probably didn't have a lot of control over that. When that <laughs> crucial moment yeah. before Giannopoulos went pro, he yeah. could he have changed his name to Robert? Well, is there some kind of irony or is it just too on the nose to point out that the man who uh, took him for a drive out to the Meadowlands, so to speak, and then took the cannoli? <laughs> Bob Bakish, right? Like that's right. You either, in this in this cutthroat industry of elite media professionals, you're either a Bob or you get done by a Bob. Yeah, you and know I, what I think mean? also you and I can both be honest with each other and say on the spectrum of names, mm -hmm. Brian is closer to Bob than Jim. It definitely starts strong. There's no <laughs> question about it. Like if if you just pause real quick, it could go either way. Um, it, the more we talk about this, a I think we're right, and I think again. The same vibes that told me about how much people loved when I used to do that bit with Jake Johnson. I think people are loving this. Yeah, so I'm, yeah. I'm confident. Yeah. Um, it is incredible that Bob Iger replaced himself as CEO with Bob Chapek. But then like it's like when you hold opposite polarity of magnets next to each other and they're kind of there's that like intense repelling action like he he can't uh, one bob cannot be replaced with another bob so Iger was like i'm just gonna replace myself into a slightly bigger position yes so that's why there are two bobs and that's i'm not, that, I'm not me, saying that there's anything similar to them but mm -hmm. he pulled a putin you know like he's just like oh, finding yeah. new new levels of the executive to stash himself in it was it was an incredible move in retrospect when putin was like i had a great run as president <laughs> I think I'll be prime minister for a while because what I love to do is serve my country as an elected official. <laughs> and, sure. and, and really, what, 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 greater, what greater pride and joy can I get out of this? Oh, okay. You want me to be president again? <laughs> oh, fine. Twist my arm. Um, okay. So the Paramount thing for people who are still listening, who I imagine at this point include Kaya. And Jim Giannopoulos. <laughs> Jim Giannopoulos just sweating bullets. Someone cooking tomato gravy next to him, just being like, oh my God. You what gotta are they slice say? the garlic so thin. Um <laughs> there's two different two different scenes from Goodfellas. <laughs> Helicopters flying over the head. Um, great stuff from us this week. Uh so the, the okay, so here's the thing about Paramount and the thing about all of this. And we are in no way the most learned on this topic, but it's just been fascinating because every flailing permutation or executive deck chair shuffling just is of a piece with a larger conversation we're having, and certainly the trades are having in a more heated manner about how no one knows what's going on and how it's going to change and how it's going to end. Yep. And basically Paramount after this Viacom CBS shakeup and then the rise of Paramount plus streaming service um, seemed to be one of the one of the media fixtures that was going to try its best to have it both ways. And in this case, what both ways means is pivoting a lot of your strength and energy towards building up your catalog and your streaming service, which is what everybody's doing across town. But Paramount also felt it was hugely important to maintain its traditional role as a Hollywood studio box office power player. And 
though that investment was really represented in not in one man, Thomas Cruise, not just by doubling down on Mission Impossible. Although sequels. also in Jonathan Krasinski. Yes, yes, yes. My old pal with Quiet Place, um, and uh, not just the Mission Impossible two sequels that were greenlit, but also finally getting around to making a Top Gun sequel, which you know, now has been pushed again into next year because of the importance of that franchise and the importance of getting some return on the investment. So the, the perception was that Paramount was going to try to do both and that it needed to do both. What we learned from this was that uh, Sherry Redstone, who I guess is the chairwoman mm -hmm. of the company, felt differently and felt that the priority for the company, which as longtime watch listeners may or may not know because we never covered it, but some people know, was only recently reunited, right? Because for many years, there was this CBS Viacom Paramount schism mm -hmm. um, with different, you know, Les Moonves was leading the charge for CBS to take over the company and the Redstones were, anyway, it all sort of- It was very out. complicated. Courts were involved. It was, yeah, it was a lot. So the idea that we're reading in the trades is that Cherry Redstone feels that the purpose of the company should be to build up its catalog and build up Paramount Plus, which is- not doing super great in the streaming wars, but like with everything, the numbers are a little bit fluid because when they talk about it, they include the Showtime subscribers in their number, plus other like minor services that they may or may not have that I may or may not have learned about from reading The Hollywood Reporter last week. There so, was one I had never heard of that is part yes. of their bundle. Yeah, it was like Noggin remember. or something? Yeah, Noggin. It, what is that like educational programming or something or like science stuff? I mean, I, I, I'm unclear. I did pitch them on Briar Patch season two. I'm not, I'm not above that. I was like, you could learn about animals. Um, what, what do I need to do to get you to say yes, to get you to yes. And, um, I couldn't do it, but anyway, Giannopoulos respected old pro movie guy brought in Emma Watts, a very respected movie executive to be his number two with the presumption that she would take over that spot. This was a shock to everyone, apparently, including the people at Paramount who in G Big Jim G's farewell Zoom put like Godfather images behind them, apparently. Yes. Um, yeah. And Brian Robbins has never, uh, has done many things in his career, as, as you said, a really crazy career, but doesn't have these like deep box office movie relationships that people have had before. What he does have is the fact that he, he greenlit Paw Patrol mm -hmm. and that movie made a ton of money. And that's what the company feels like it should be going forward. It also, reading the tea leaves, means there are a bunch of awkward conversations coming with people who don't want their movies to be day and date on Paramount+, Plus, which is the same conversations that all the studios are having, the conversations that Warner's kickstarted last year, which led to the other big news of the week, which we can get to after we're done talking about Big Jim, uh, which is the Christopher Nolan news. And I think it's yeah. actually all one story. It is. It is all one story. So, I mean, my main interest in uh, the Paramount story, for the most part, is exactly what you're talking about in terms of like what is Paramount to the traditional relationships that they have throughout Hollywood and, and as, as a movie studio. I'm very curious to see whether this era, whether we are at, on the precipice of or an approaching era of consolidation with some of these streaming services or whether some of these quote unquote streaming services will sort of start to redefine themselves as content providers rather than content platforms. So that was actually something that Jimmy G did say that he was interested in doing it was not only just making stuff for Paramount, but being a shop and making stuff and Paramount studios would make something. And then that would be something that was on uh, the Disney Hulu or it would be on, on Amazon or be on Netflix or whatever, like that they would be in the, we're selling our wares business. And I'm, Which traditionally they were. Yeah. And, you know, for example, if anyone from Noggin is listening, Paramount were co-producers on the USA television show Briar Patch. That's so right. just to bring it back to that failed Noggin pitch, I mean, that's true. That's canon. So, but I think that there were some takeaways, I think, in The Hollywood Reporter had a pretty, pretty good write-up about this whole thing with Robbins, is that um, this will signal an era of, if you read between the lines, belt tightening to some extent, and sort of like, mid-tier programming. I don't know mm -hmm. if that's the case. I think that we've been here before where someone, say Jason Clark, gets the job uh, at Warner's and it's like, well, they're going to turn into essentially like a, uh, you know, Nat Geo streaming, like a Discovery Plus streaming service. And it's like, that's obviously not the case. HBO has had 
arguably one of their best years in a long time, right? And Discovery bought them. And Discovery so, <laughs> bought them, right. So we're still we're not out of the woods yet. But I guess I'm just I'm very fascinated to see where these services or traditional studios go between, hey, we have our platform, we have our subscriber mm-hmm. base, we want to have people on in here checking out the libraries. I still think the state of the libraries, as Sean has talked about before, is way worse than I thought it was going to be by this point, where I thought there would be this really good curated archived movie experience on these services. And I find them actually to a T it's really difficult to navigate and find stuff. And I usually just have to Google where is this streaming and then surprisingly find out it's on Macs or find out I have it for free on Amazon. That's one part of the conversation. The other is the one that you alluded to, which is the possibly clickbaity, but increasingly like obvious tension between some of Hollywood's biggest filmmakers and some of Hollywood's biggest studios, which is Nolan going around at Hollywood, going around town to the tech companies too, and saying, I'll make my movie for you. I'm sure he's like, I want final cut and this huge budget. And I want a 110 day theatrical window, which means my movie will not be on a streaming service for three and a half, four months, you know, a more apparently he also asked for and, and, and I've seen it reported that he had this at Warner Brothers. So it's not like he's making new sets of demands. He wants a blackout from that studio for other movies. Like he doesn't want other movies from right. the same studio released right. within two or three weeks around his. And so he's he's going to be making it with Universal. That means Universal would not then also drop a Jurassic Park sequel, I guess, the same week as right. Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer movie. So it's a really interesting tectonic shift. I, I note that, you know, David Chase, somebody who we associate with being the one of the primary architects of the modern television era, it, it was like honestly despondent about the day and oh, date. Yeah, I, like I, I've of, been thinking about this and, and, and yeah. haunted by it. People who have read David Chase interviews for a while know that he thinks there is nothing lower in civic or cultural life than the television. <laughs> like he is so appalled and disgusted by the medium that he helped not just rehabilitate, but elevate. And that is not because of his experience making The Sopranos with HBO, which was, I I don't even think he would argue, like the defining creative experience of his career. Um, It was the previous 25 years when he was like, you know, third on the writer's room call sheet for Kolchak the Night Stalker. You know, it's not just that he saw the way the sausage gets made. He saw the way the like big ConAgra sausage gets made. You know what I mean? This was not your current like artisanal fresh yeah. apples no, and it was, it was chicken it was tilda swinton overlooking the, 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 the cornfields <laughs> i thought you, I thought you meant that the sausages were made of tilda swinton no i meant like in the michael clayton sense of her just being right. like right yeah right yeah pits uh, or, pit stains yeah, and all ex- exactly um so all he wanted was the chance to make a movie and he made that movie not fade away which i actually quite liked and then Finally, he gets the opportunity to elevate The Sopranos and make this prequel. And then for personal reasons, he's unable to direct it himself, although clearly he wrote it and he worked with Alan Taylor, who directed many episodes of the TV show. And then at the end of this journey for it to be pulled back to HBO, I mean, if only there was a famous quote from a popular Italian mafia film in which a character bemoans being yanked in a direction into something that he thought he was free from. I, if only I, that was at the tip of my tongue, I could call upon it. I Maybe can't. if you were wearing your cardigan, it would have helped. <laughs> Great point. Should have worn the cardigan today. Um, that is really true. And, and, and that, that's an example where I'm not like, oh, you know, Denis Villeneuve is right. Like, I'm sure the optics of Dune would play better in IMAX or whatever. No, this is me just feeling on a personal level for David yeah. Chase. But at the end of all of this conversation is this thing that I think we should circle back to and underline, which is the degree to which no one knows what the fuck is going on is wild. Mm-hmm. It's wild. Almost anything is conceivable to the point where I had a conversation recently with someone who's not in the industry, but a, a, an avid industry watcher and, and writes about it and thinks about it. And in his mind, it's not just at the age of that, that uh, we're headed towards a, a moment of consolidation. It's that when this consolidation happens, Warner, Discovery, Warner, HBO, Max, whatever they're called, could buy, just buy Universal. Or Comcast Universal could buy them. Mm -hmm. Both were plausible, right? Maybe it doesn't matter at a certain point. But the main takeaway here is no one knows what's going on. This new version of Paramount could just sell the Paramount lot 
for money because maybe they don't need it anymore in the same way that CBS sold BlackRock, which was like the physical definition of the company back when physical definitions of anything meant something. So now we're in this moment where, you know, when you read these stories about the studios making the hat in hand tour to Christopher Nolan's Hollywood compound, by the way, I mean, by the way, when do we get our compound? It could be small. Could I know. Be some sticks. I could go. I would go cones. for like a, a Duplass level compound. You know. Yeah, it's like just rent a house in Eagle Rock. Like call adjoining, it a joining, like Love houses it. with a yard shared. You know. Fine. Anyway, in addition to Universal and every, I mean, everyone except Warner's, who were like, well, guess we botched that one. Uh, Apple went. Mm-hmm. Apple just took the meeting, kicked the tires in the same way that they've been like, yeah, we're not sure we're going to invent an Apple car, but. We'll spend a couple billy just thinking about it for a decade. Like NBD, they could go have that meeting and be like, "Yeah, we'll put it in theaters." They could literally put it in theaters and not care, Apple and then put could it on their service. Single handedly, probably just build a series of movie theaters if they wanted they, to. Chris, if they wanted to really service Christopher Nolan's dream of an Oppenheimer movie, they could just make an atomic bomb. Yeah, and be like, <laughs> "Film this one. We built it for you." It was not a big deal for us. Yeah. So I it it it's just it's just kind of a crazy moment where nothing much makes sense and it's hard to draw any conclusions from any one thing. There's been a lot of talk and we'll be talking about it, I'm sure, much more in the months to come. But just like a fundamental question, I was I was talking about this with our buddy Zach Barron, who writes for GQ and talking about TV stuff. And you know, Amazon has this Wheel of Time show coming very soon. Mm-hmm. And then next year they have Lord of the Rings. And it's just like, you could spend, and I have, and we have on the podcast, and we will again, many, many minutes, if not hours, being like, well, here's the benefits of having two massive fan base-driven fantasy pieces of IP. But you know what? It's because Jeff Bezos likes Lord of the Rings. That's why. Yeah. He's like, I like that. It's still, there's Here's still the credit, credit card. Here's the company a, card. Go get it. There is a Steinbrenner can effect with that? here. You know what I mean? Like there is yes. still ultimately at the top of the pyramid. If somebody is like, I'm into it, like it tends to happen. So that's, that's interesting. Meanwhile, this weekend, the Emmys uh, hosted by Cedric, the entertainer. And one of the, I think, you know, you and I have been, I think fairly engaged Emmy watchers, but nowhere near the way say like Sean and Amanda are obviously tracking the Oscars from, yeah. August through the the final award on Oscar night. The Emmys have always been a little bit more confounding partially because their window of eligibility never really corresponds with what feels like it's important when the Emmys are on. Although I will say the Emmys seem to be timed very well this year where there's, um, you know, we've got Ted Lasso up for tons of awards for their first season. They are going through the, the home stretch of their second season. I think that the categories are incredibly strong this year. There's some really good uh, performances up for up for nomination. So I'm looking forward to Sunday night. I don't necessarily think it will change my mind about what is and isn't important and what people do and don't care about. But it is a really strong group of of nominees, and we can probably break that down on Monday after the fact. Yeah, I think I'm looking forward to it. I, I'd, I'd also note, in case anyone else is lost in Robert B. Jordan's Wheel of Time during the pandemic, I, that last year's Emmys we're, we're, to my mind, the only pandemic era awards show or event to get it right. It was a very enjoyable show, not just in terms of the awards, but the show itself, they put together, they put together a good show. And yeah. so I'm looking forward to that as well this year. Um, and I it, think it'll be interesting because all eyes will be tuned to the absolute blood sport, which is the miniseries category. Yeah. The limited series anthology, which is uh, this year, it's I May Destroy You, Mayor of Easttown, Queen's Gambit, Underground Railroad, and WandaVision. I mean, that's, that is, that's insane. That's, that's where we're at with TV right now in one category and no tea leaves other than to say the creative arts Emmys, which are, you know, the ones that they don't give out on camera in the main telecast were given out last weekend and, um, Queens Gambit cleaned TF up including and Mandalorian did quite well as well. Shout out to Eric Hirsch, sound editor of Queens Gambit, uh, brother of our friend Gina Hirsch, who won oh, two Emmys for his work on Queen's Gambit. So, but I don't know if one leads to the other, but it, if you're, if you're a betting person, I think I was coming into this thinking Mayor, Mayor was going to take it. And I still think Mayor is, you know, I think Kate Winslet is in prime position for Let's the acting. Let's just remember Queen's Gambit was a juggernaut. Like it was. It, I, I think that we, you loved know, we loved it and we talked about it a lot. I, I've, I've oft cited its appearance on an NFL broadcast of them talking about like mm-hmm. everybody's talking about queen's gambit but 
what about Kyler Murray and the way he sees the chessboard? And it's and they did like a whole graphic package for that. That doesn't happen with TV shows really anymore, unless it's like a, a tie-in for a network where like NBC is like, guess who also fell through some tar pits? La Brea, Wednesday night, and now we're talking about Carson Wentz. Dude, uh, <laughs> dude, when the Mannings were in the booth, did they talk about like an edge rusher like coming over the line of scrimmage like Mare reaching for a cheesesteak or something? Like, did that happen? Did you see any of that? No. that th- they should take over this podcast. Those two guys. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Chris, <laughs> I, I, I love you. I love this podcast. I don't think it would be hard <laughs> to replace us. Like I like you know what I mean? Like if if for some reason we both held out for like ten minutes, <laughs> like I don't think that that we would be I don't think we'd be that tough. I think the show would roll on as much I, as I love doing this. They were just really like they were really brothers. And there was like <laughs> there's like very early on in the in the Raiders Ravens game, like the Raiders failed to convert like a third and eleven and Peyton Manning was just like, This team sucks, they're going six and eleven. <laughs> Really? <laughs> yeah, it was really good. Um, well, we can wrap up our sort of state of the industry and state of the Emmys conversation because I'm sure we're going to talk about both on Monday. Is that like me dismissing Why the Last Man after <laughs> two episodes? Do you want to make a statement? I feel like you brought this up twice. No, it just... I, I don't want to address very small niches of our audience, you know? Like Kai is always telling us, you know, play I, I the, am. I, I the think biggest crowd possible, you know? What I noticed... Play I mean, ever listen, long, you know? We've been trying to play to the biggest crowd possible for 10 years. And I think we're good with our, we know who our fans are. Um, no, I just feel like maybe my word choice was poor because I I, I know that it's kind of a... Well, can you remind to be, anybody who didn't hear well, what you said? What you no, did? Th- this podcast has to be enjoyed. This is a deeply serialized podcast. Deeply serialized podcast. And this whole episode is not going to make sense if you haven't listened to the previous 500 and That is 90. true. All that Bob stuff is complete nonsense. Nothing. If you don't, yeah, it's true. But I... I <laughs> This is both a humble brag and a humble, uh, what's the opposite of brag? Shame. Because as I said, before we started, I was, I was chatting with friend of the podcast, Damon Lindelof, and he, he said something and I was like, oh, did you hear us talk about that? I never do that. And there was just a long pause and he was like, no, I'm no. And, and, and implicit in that no was like, I'm busy running three television shows and sure. polishing my Emmys. Like, no. Um, so I think that it, it it's a, the audience, our listenership does bump when it seems like we're veering into the why did this get made conversation. First of all, because that's a different podcast. Um, shout out to Paul and Jason. But two, because that is, I think, seen as just kind of a epistemological dead end. Like you could say that about anything. What, what kind of question is that to ask about art? And I think I want to, the only thing I want to come back and say about why the last man, I think it, for me, what I what I struggled with was I know why this show got made, and we covered it extensively, just in terms of sunk cost and deep belief or fandom in the material. That's why it got made. It's always been incredibly promising. I think what frustrated me and why I'm not sure I'm going to go along on the journey was because the box that it came in mm-hmm. doesn't seem to me to be the right box to tell the types of stories that either the creative team is interested in telling or, and this is me stepping even further outside, the moment, cultural moment, not demands, but um, suggests. That's kind of what I was struggling to say. And when I said, the word that I used that I think people bumped on when I said something was cruel was that just for me personally, because they have to do it, and they did it as tastefully as they could, but the way the story depicted mass death of billions of people with these characters who we've only known for a brief amount of time. And then we knew we would have to then see them pivot from grief into action for multiple seasons felt cruel. Maybe is too strong a word. It felt a little callous in this moment. Uh, it, It either be about grief and treat it with the respect that it deserves, or maybe move on and be about something else that that was my bump on the show. Some of that's personal. Some of that's, more about the moment, the larger moment. Yeah, moment I think we were in. actually trying to unpack the why did this need to exist or why why this show, why now? Like we were actually saying- More that like it, why the no, last but man, that was actually I what, right? I think what we were saying was like, we have often yeah. like banged our head up. I, I thought that was, I, I set you up Thanks. for that pun, but I didn't sell I, it. I'm sorry. No, I appreciate that. Um, 
You know, I, Jake Johnson and I would have landed the plane. <laughs> I was just going to say that I agree with you. Yeah. We, we don't have to deliberate. Kaya, did you like that joke? Do you think we should have given it more airtime, more more space, more air? I think Chris could have given like a heartier laugh. <laughs> That's a good note. Put that in the show notes. Thank you, Kaya. Why don't we take a break? And when we come back, we'll talk about something we agree on, which is reservation dogs. This episode is brought to you by Mint Mobile. New Year's resolutions are fun the first couple of weeks. Then you kind of maybe conveniently forget about them halfway through January. No shame. It happens to us all. But this year, I have a foolproof plan, at least when it comes to saving money. Just switch to Mint Mobile and you're done. Goal accomplished. Because for a limited time, their wireless plans are 15 bucks a month when you buy a three-month plan. The great thing about Mint Mobile is there's no jaw-dropping monthly bills or unexpected overages, and all plans come with unlimited talk and text. Get this new customer offer today at mintmobile.com slash watch. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. Andy, why don't we talk about Reservation Dogs, uh, which is a show that we both felt very warmly about when we first talked about it a few weeks ago. That was the first few episodes. Uh, it's on FX on Hulu. Um, and I, I was a huge fan of the second episode, which uh, featured a guest performance from Bobby Lee. We talked about our obvious affinity for the uh, not only the world that Sterling Harjo built, but clearly like some of the references that he's pulling from, which I think you and I both count as similar uh, influences on us or similar you know touchstones for us. Then there was a middle batch of episodes, which I thought were quite good, and I enjoyed uh, you know quite a bit. Uh, and we didn't really remark upon those, but there was a uh, you know we meet with the sort of families and worlds of of these main characters starts to expand a little bit, and then something happens that I just don't really remember recently taking place because I feel like a lot of TV that we watch these days is often. Um, it's like a Motown record. They put all the hits up top. Like you can just feel like all the good ideas from the whiteboard, like jumping into the, into the early scripts and not that TV shows show their hand too early or anything like that. But I do think maybe I watch too many mysteries or some, something is up where I'm like, Oh wow, this started really strong and then kind of started to lose some gas at the end. That's not the case for reservation dogs. The last three episodes of reservation dogs, which is come and get your love hunting is that the the episode and the most recent one which is california dreaming and the finale is on on monday are among three of the best episodes of tv you'll see this year i don't remember a run where a tv show puts together these this this kind of leap in season and at this point in the season i i suppose there's moments in atlanta that, like where that has happened that, that's the and, example i would use you know but in terms of feeling like this almost weightlessness when you're watching the show and this idea that like this show could truly be anything it wants to be, go in any direction, be a comedy, be a heartbreaking drama, be like a weird, you know, borderline supernatural kind of fable. It can be hilarious. It can be sad. It can be, it's so well made. It's so well shot. It's so well scored. It's so well acted. And this, Thing that they've got where they've basically every episode has a ringer coming out of the bullpen, Bill Burr, West Studi, and throwing 99 out of nowhere is just awesome. It's so cool. And it's one of my favorite shows of the year. I just I uh I, I just thought we should celebrate it. I, I totally agree. I think the um I would use the I was gonna use Atlanta as the analogy. Obviously, it's the same development team at FX. Atlanta is the last series that I can remember that started with a pilot that in no way was generic, but felt familiar enough to understand. And from that point, use the goodwill and momentum built. It's like it's like, like an impressionist painter showing they can do a still life quickly and then getting as weird as possible. Mm -hmm. Because if you remember, like the 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 episode of Atlanta uh, where Paperboy is on like the Charlie Rose show, that was the first season. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the stones on those guys to do that are incredible. It's a similar playbook. But think about what we're saying. Sure, Reservation Dogs, your playbook is to in some way do justice to and then expand on something done only by the greatest TV show of the last 10 years, arguably. That's that's tough. Nobody can do that except they did that here. And I am totally in awe. 
the first episode is charming and delightful and fun, and it's noisy. And noisy is an annoying word that you hear a lot in TV development these days. And it's mostly about what's big and can happen in the first episode that's going to hook people because it's really crowded out there. And I'm saying this as someone who put a second car bomb in the pilot of his TV show just in case people didn't notice the first one because that was super noisy. In many ways, it was a Trojan horse for what the series was going to be. Because while, yes, the show is superficially about these four friends living in on the reservation in a part of Oklahoma that a lot of people in America aren't familiar with and, and don't pay much attention to, the purpose of the show is so much broader and richer and deeper. It's about a community. It's about a people. It's about all the emotions in the past, present, and potentially future of a place sunk into the soil. And it's deeply emotional and satisfying. And it's filmmaking, man. I mean, this guy, Sterling Harjo, knows what he's doing. I don't know if people other than us, I assume other than us, have listened to him on Mark Marin, but it's a great interview. And you do get a sense of how long he's been working at telling stories. Neither of us have seen his movies, but I, I would like to remedy that. But he's been at the Sundance Lab. The Taika Waititi relationship isn't FX was like, this guy does good work for us. You work together. They knew each other. And mm -hmm. they had had long conversations about storytelling and what moved them. And the fact that the show, just without breaking a sweat, went from the very cozy and nice and surprising, but still ultimately comforting comedy of the early episodes, into this just absolutely challenging, rollicking, exhilarating, just alive storytelling of these last three episodes it I, i'm stunned and, and and it's across the board we'll get into it but you see these kids who they who who hard joe cast and you're like i like them i'd hang out with them and i think in the first episode we were talking about how um you know the the, the kid who plays bear defaro Wu natai i was like oh this guy he looks like a movie star like that's yeah right he's right. the breakout or whatever and then piece by piece you have these episodes devoted to each individual actor Leading up to this week's episode, which was essentially a two-hander between Bill Burr, who really love a Bill Burr performance when he's not doing his Boston accent. Like, that was pretty great. Um, with Devery Jacobs, who delivers yeah. the previous week hunting. Paulina Alexis, who plays Willie Jack, who you're always enjoying. Oh, have fun. What a, like, yeah, she's, she's like a little pistol relief. starter in the crew. She's like Kramer, yeah, yeah. The hunting episode is absolutely gutting and And the guy who plays her dad, layered. John Proudstar, is just like, did, what the fuck is going on? Like, how is this, this guy I'm is incredible? Say, here's the thing. This is what we're doing this for. Not just us as podcasters who love stuff, but all this Hollywood thing, I'm gesturing wildly out the window here. Yeah, but it's Brian Robbins, Jimmy G, all the bobs. Yeah. This is what we're doing. Yes. Take your tired ass woke narratives or whatever, throw them in the garbage. Throw them in the Meadowlands where Bob Bakish took Jim G, all due respect. There is a whole world out there of story, but also of actors, of place, of location, of cadence and rhythm that we haven't seen before. And it's fucking thrilling. Yeah, I just I cannot state how much I've loved these last few episodes. Now excited I am that there are going to be more. I get the same charges like mm -hmm. watching like the cadences back and forth and the interplay between the actors as I do when I watch like a David Mamet play. Like where I'm just like I know this language but not entirely. I know these people but I they're they're, they're unfamiliar to me. But like the, the rhythms of it are the thing that's seductive. And you just you find yourself basically getting lost in the beats of the of the storytelling, but also in the in the beats of the performances. It's so enveloping and yeah man i mean like i'll say this you know i've never obviously worked on writing a television show i can only imagine how difficult it is you can speak to it but you can often see the bones of of the writing when you're watching a show where you're like ah yes the b plot ah yes the c plot ah yes the theme or whatever the way in which over the course of these three episodes the creative team behind this show sprinkles increasing amounts of detail about what is obviously the galvanizing event in these young people's lives, which is mm -hmm. the death of their friend Daniel, which is alluded to in the beginning of this of the season, but is explained a little bit more in depth until kind of it's quite clearly depicted in, in the most recent episode, is masterful. It's absolutely masterful. Mm -hmm. You don't know like you don't know who it affected the most. You don't know how it happened. You don't know what's going on. It obviously is something that's touched all of these people in different ways. And it's kind of spurred them not only to want to go to California, but also to sort of start investigating like who they are. You know, the episode with Cheese as a, as a junior detective doing a ride along is, is, is just like one of the funniest 
most inventive episodes of TV you can possibly see. But the whole thing now ties together into a larger story. And you're like, that's fucking TV writing, man. Like that is yes. upper, upper echelon TV writing. And just because I don't want to forget to say it again, like the episode you're talking about with the ride along, um, come and get your love. It has Zon McLaren, who we've mentioned before when talking about the show, we've mentioned when talking about Fargo or Westworld. People think of him, I think at this point, hopefully as one of the better actors working in TV. Um, you can always count on him. He delivers. People remember him. They remember his face. Him being in something has some significance. I don't think anybody knew how funny he was. And no one gave him the chance. Similarly, Wes Studi, last seen eating a man's heart still beating out of his body in Last of the Mohicans, not last seen, but memorably seen, is so delightful in that same episode. So surprising. Just so... It's like when it's like when you bring in the left-handed reliever who you just, you know, maybe throws a loopy underhand and you can't hit it. Like, bringing a rhythm that we don't know to that episode, it's just a joy. And to your point about the writing, I couldn't agree more because what we're seeing now, and I think FX was at the forefront of realizing this, and I'm sure we've said a version of this before when talking about different shows, there's been a deviation in terms of TV writing as the stakes, the noisiness factor has gotten more important, where drama series, in order to exist, have to be, shouts to Christopher Nolan's upcoming film Oppenheimer, explosive, mm -hmm. nuclear. They have to ask the biggest possible questions at the highest level of stakes, and they have to come baked in with the promise of answers. They are all event series mm -hmm. now, right? You can't just sort of slow pitch a show. I, I'd argue that you should, because now's the time to, to zag when everyone's zigging. But a show that just kind of begins and then sets you off on a path, whether it's Mad Men or, or Succession is probably the last great example of that. That's not really no. I mean, it's like vogue. if you're trying to and, pitch a family drama, it better have a "This Is Us" hook to it, right? And, and it's the more hooks you cram in, the more plot you cram in, the more meth you have to cook to justify your existence and to satisfy that piece of the fan base. The less room there is for the emotional storytelling to just kind of happen, to just bubble up, to percolate, and so the best examples of that emotional storytelling has fallen to the half hour where you can get an episode like the one that aired this week that we're talking about with Bill Burr and and with with, with Bill Burr and, and Devery Jacobs riding around in a driving test that takes some surprising turns. The emotion that is generated in 25 minutes of screen time because there is no, it doesn't have to be anything. Yeah, the episode can just be. The dope, the thing is, is that that is literally the setup for that episode is, is a is a modern family episode where it's mm -hmm. like Haley has to go pass her driver's license test and she's failed a couple of times. Like the setups are not crazy. It's, it's the execution that is singular. Yeah, it, it absolutely the case. And knowing now that we are in a world where we can tell stories that are funny and affecting in the short term, but also in the long term, why these kids are like this, what's happened to them, the loss and, and pain that they're experiencing in their own lives, this California dream, what it means, whether they would go, whether they would stay. I mean, all of that is there. And also, seven episodes in, I would watch an entire episode just about West Duty's character or yep. about Willie Jack's dad yeah. or about what they're seeing in the woods. I mean, there's an episode that is about everything and nothing and also a murderous lady who's a deer. Yep, And what that tells me is, like with Atlanta, anything is possible here, all within a very contained, very specific aesthetic point of view. And that's, that's what we're doing this for. It's Absolutely. Awesome. Do you want to talk a little bit about Feel Good before we go? I love Feel Good. Friends, here's the other reason we're doing it at this moment. There's, what, 400, 500 scripted series out there at the mm -hmm. moment? I would say right um, now we're in this place where, because you and I remarked upon this, where it was like, there's a lot of like, okay to pretty good stuff that's that's on the air right now that is, you and I are at various stages of completion or engagement with, but until Res and Feel Good, it felt like there was a little bit of a lack of exceptional stuff, right? And, you know, we check, we name check things that we have seen, haven't caught up with, Things like Money Heist that people tell us to watch and we probably should, but we haven't Stuff yet. Stuff that only one of us has seen, like like Northwater or whatever, yeah. 
I've seen half. I'm, I'm getting true. there. It's a I mean, long journey up north. Okay. <laughs> it's not, it's not an every night kind of show in my household. But what's amazing is that one can still be surprised. And I mentioned sound editor Eric Hirsch a moment ago, his sister Gina, Briar Patch editor and our good friend, just mentioned to me in passing the other week, oh, we've really enjoyed the show called Feel Good. Had never heard of it. That's on me, but had never heard of it. Maybe you have, you, Ustedes, the plural you, the listener. If you haven't, you will now and you should. One of the best shows of the year. It is a Canadian-British co-production. First season was Channel 4 and second season Netflix picked it up. So it's available on Netflix. The first season was last year. The second season was this year. Two six-episode seasons. Episodes average about 25 minutes. If you're the sort of person who's budgeting your time, this is a very good investment. The show was created by a Canadian comedian named Mae Martin who lives in London. And it is loosely autobiographical, in some ways based on their life. And May Martin created the show with a comedy, a British comedy writer named Joe Hampson. And in the show, May Martin is May Martin, a comedian in London with a history of addiction issues and some questionable decision making in relationships. And May falls in love with a woman who, until that moment, identifies as straight. And that's George, played by Charlotte Ritchie. And that's the setup. That's the show. And in 12 episodes, Feel Good manages to say more about love, romance, dating, sexuality, and addiction in our modern world than I, I don't even have a clever or pithy comparison. The economy and honesty and incredible humor with which the show deals with very heavy, twisty subject matter, mm -hmm. the sort of stuff that not just other TV shows, but conversations tend to shy away from such as like, what kind of sex do you want? Why am I, why do I want this? What does this say about me that I want this, but I used to want this? And what am I even doing here? <laughs> it's all there. And Mae Martin is such a compelling writer and performer, totally charismatic. They liken themselves often to um, a piece of corn, I think <laughs> is, a, is a common comparison. Um, I, I was so struck by this show. And by the end, I was just so in love with it. And I can't believe how quickly it happened. It, it, that's the kind of the connection I wanted to make with Reservation Dogs, that it's the joy of TV historically, I think, has been you know, season three of Parks and Rec. These are my best friends, I think. <laughs> In today's heightened yeah. TV culture, like both of these shows accomplished this so quickly, where I would love a show about the supporting characters or when... As, as she does on Feel Good, Lisa Kudrow shows up intermittently as May's mother. Like, I, I, I know her and her husband and the world in Canada and everything that that means. I, supporting characters on Feel Good, like in Reservation Dogs, are in the background for five episodes and then play crucial roles for 20 minutes in the sixth. And you're like, yep, that's my favorite person. It's, it's really, it was a thrilling experience to have a total surprise. And I love the show. Do you know if they're going to do a third season? They're not. Hmm. They're not. That's the other thing. I, I, they could, there was so much more meat left on the bone and, and, and May Martin is in interviews is like, that was, that was that it was always designed to be that. And I have other things I want to work on and do. Um, one of which I believe was semi-announced and is a drama. So unclear, but I, I am a huge fan. Yeah. Uh, I, I've really enjoyed the episodes that I've seen. I have to admit, I've weirdly watched it like in a kind of pre agro fan or sort of TV watching way where I've like watched an episode, missed an episode, watched an episode because m my wife has been watching it, but I've really liked what I've seen and I'll have to go back and do give it a little bit more scrutiny. It's just, you know, I'm, I'm up here with Colin Farrell biting into my arm. So it's tough. I, I understand. It's tough to get that tooth out. It's, it's just that I, I guess the last thing I'll say about this purely from a, um, you know, money manager point of view, I know that our listeners and you, Chris have fondness for rom-coms and, this show, in addition to having really profound and sometimes unsettling, but almost always funny things to say about just modern life and addiction, whether it's to drugs or to anything, this show is has so much rom and so much calm. Mm -hmm. It's really, <laughs> it's really chock full of both in a way. Are that you is not just a rom com person? No, no, I think I am, but every but listeners might think I'm not because every time you're like, you know, four weddings and a funeral, or you know, or love life. Like I really, I really dug those and I have not been able to right. dig alongside of you. My shovel broke. There's a new, so, do you see the, the new love life is coming? William Jackson Harper. Friend of the pod. Yeah. 
Is it? Can you call people friend of the pod if they come on once with another guest? <laughs> I mean, sure. <laughs> in, that, in that case, I mean, Kate Winslet is the, the fairy godmother of the podcast. Then. Kate Winslet is a friend of the pod because she <laughs> listened to the pod and said, can I come back on the pod? Yes. If that's the bar to clear, then who has cleared that bar? Her? Manzukis? Is that it? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that might be it. I think that's it. I guess Damon and Sam. Yes. Although I tested it with Damon and I think the he bar be busy. The, the bar has lowered or we have, we've lowered our own bar or he's busy. Okay, so uh, Reservation Dogs finale is on Monday. Uh, FX on Hulu. Feel Good is available in its entirety on Netflix now. Emmys are on Sunday night. I'm going to do a green room beforehand. There will be tweets about that. Uh, if you just download the green room app on your phone, if you have a Spotify account, it's very easy to use. So check me out. Uh, I'll just do predictions and, and take questions and stuff like that before the ceremony begins. And I'm trying to think if we have any other shows that we need people to watch for pod purposes. Obviously, it's like we're just we're we're not treading water until Succession, but we're we're doing our thing until Succession, which is about three weeks out, four weeks out. Did you see the French took out a major Al Qaeda target in the Sahara? Like I, I feel like that was Le Bureau season six. <laughs> so you, should we watch that? Do you want to? Do you want to? I just, that I just felt down? like I felt like that was viral marketing. Was that just like an mean? Apple News headline that popped up on your computer? I was like, mm. mm-hmm. yeah, I see what's uh, going on. Here. Um, all right, we are as always produced by Kaya McMullen. Uh, Andy Greenwald is is my my co-pilot and uh yeah he's we'll also see produced you. by kai mcmullen <laughs> he's also Let's produced by kai mcmullen uh we're taking off talk to you guys next week <laughs>